to the Jeff Willis Show. Today I have with me Hanny Fass. Now, Hanny is originally from Egypt and uh, he also, um, we discovered, uh, did his MBA in Sydney, which is where I live. So we already have a common point of connection and uh, history, I suppose. And uh, just a little bit about Hanny. Now, Hanny's been playing around different parts and nooks of the planet. And uh, he did his MBA. Um, then he went and worked for MasterCard. And he was the president of Enterprise Partnerships. And he was there for uh, a generation, frankly, nearly 25 years. So um, he also then worked with uh, AXA. And then he decided to strike out on his own pour everything he had into a company called Marquez. Now, what's Marquez? According to Forbes, uh, it's the world's first global platform to verify and connect every small business on the planet. And I believe there are 119 million of them. And we're going to discover a little bit more um, to about that. So um, Okay, so Hanny just sent me a note. I don't know what it was about, really, but he can tell me later. <laughs> Have I said something wrong, Hanny? <laughs> Have I said something wrong, Hanny? No, it's fine. It's okay. fine. Okay. No, we're good. We're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. We, we'll get the lawyers to check this later. Okay, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, well, my partner's a lawyer, so I can get her to check this at any rate. So that's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, before we sign off anything, we you know want to agree it too. So, um, so Hanny started in 2019, I believe. Was that correct, Hanny? The Marquez. We started Marquez in uh, uh, December 11th, 2019. Yep. So that is a pretty big mission, um, and uh, to actually connect those. And welcome to the show, Hanny. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. You're from Austin, pleasure Texas. Pleasure to be here. He's in a podcast booth. He looks like a rock star. Um, in the spotlight. <laughs> I look like I'm working from my home office, and I am. So um, <laughs> welcome to the show, Hanny. It's an absolute pleasure. Thrilled to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so when I read uh, a little bit about you and discovered that you went to the University of Technology in Sydney, uh, which is just a hop, step and a jump from my home, I went, wow, that's, that's rather uh, synchron a lot of synchronicity there. So um, and it lived in Australia for a while and then left and never came back, frankly. So, uh, and used to live in, he told me he lived in a place called Newport, which is a fantastic beach on the northern peninsula of Sydney, which we in Sydney call the Insular Peninsula because it's, uh, <laughs> it, it uh, is a sort of long way from Sydney. They have this own, own sort of beach culture, um, but most fabulous people I've live up there. I've, I've uh, got quite a few friends that live there. So now I am curious, Hanny, I've already covered a little bit in the pre-show, you know, before we hit the record button, but uh, what, I sort of got an idea, I think, what how you got into it, but what made you take everything you had basically and start Marquez? What yeah. was that called? So so Jeff, the, the call was a big one. Uh, and I, I, I wished I'd had the courage to do it earlier in my life. But bottom line was basically um, some years earlier when I was at MasterCard, we created a platform called Track, which was the world's first global trading platform to connect every supplier and buyer on the planet. And we did that because there were two fundamental problems that were unaddressed in the market for all the players that were out there. And the two problems for that platform were, where's my money and where's my stuff? Uh, sounds yep. stupid, but yep. really, really poorly addressed. And we learned something when we created Track. Uh, we learned that um, pre-populating a directory of all the players, which is actually really hard to do, and having them come claim their record is very different to asking people to come sign up onesie twosies. Yep. Um, when we created Marquez, 
we were thinking about the small business world. And this is well before COVID, well before all the challenges that small businesses have faced. We found that there were two fundamental problems that small businesses were facing. Number one is they're drowning in what we call point to point solutions or individual little bits of software that they're sold typically for somewhere between 50 and $200 a month. Uh, on average, they, su they subscribe to about 25 of these. Uh, each. Wow. Uh, yep. They're using less than 10% of the feature functionality of these programs, and it costs them about 15% of their total expenses. Terrible. Problem number one. And the worst culprits for that is the investment community that keeps encouraging people to create yet another widget or yet another bit of software that doesn't talk to anything else. Terrible. And we're very outspoken about that. Problem number one. Problem number two is they're spending about 15 to 17 days a year verifying who they are wow. for everything they need. I need a new bank loan. I need an insurance policy. I need a lease. I need a whatever. Lots and lots of time wasted. And in the world of small business, that's a lifetime, 15 to 17 days a year. If you want to put a number on it globally, conservatively, that's about $1.7 trillion a year in waste. Wow. So that's the yep. second problem. Add to that then the fact that small businesses, um, most of what they're using to run their small business is cut downs or, as we would call it, kindergarten versions of big software solutions out there. So companies who have big, big solutions for big enterprises, they shrink them down and say, here you go, small business. Let's figure out how much we can charge for this. That's a problem. So there is literally no single community for small businesses to plug into. Uh, Amazon doesn't do it. Google doesn't do it. Uh, Facebook doesn't do it. All the big names that all blabber about how important small businesses are and how they support them do not do any of this. Let's be very clear about that. And so armed with the scars and souvenirs we had from building track, we said, let's build a single unified community for small businesses. By the way, there's about 300 million of them in the world. So getting them together in one place and pre-populating a directory of small businesses is a Herculean task. You know, as they say, boys and girls at home, don't try this. It's hard. It's expensive and it's complex. We've done it before. And the people who did it with us before are at it again. So that was the big calling, Jeff. We went one step further which we didn't do in track. And that is we wanted to pre-verify everyone in this directory. So as you rightly said at the beginning, we have 119 million. We'll be at about 170 million in the next four weeks. And we're going to be at all 300 million of them by the end of this year. And we know how we're going to get there. But we've gone to the expense and we've, we've borne this expense of pre-verifying everyone. That means that if I wanted to find Jeff Bulis Inc., whether you're a big or a small business, you're going to be in the Marquez directory. And it's the only place on the planet you can find every other business. Number one, you know, whether you're the little hotel or the little coffee shop in Romania or your Walmart in America, we're going to find you in the platform. The difference with Marquez to everything else is I'll know you've been pre-verified and you're a legit business. Why is that important? Because today, when we've gone through what we've gone through in COVID, 60% of people who supply goods and services to small business have gone pop, have gone out of business. And we were drowning mid-COVID because we did a lot of research mid-COVID. We were drowning in people telling us stories. This guy or this company asked me for money, pay up front for these services or these goods, and they never turned up. It's a big issue. Problem number one. Problem number two Small businesses are the number one global target for cyber attacks. Number one, it's not a big company problem. It's not a government problem. It's a small business problem. The number one target for cyber hacks, phishing attempts, et cetera, is small business. The second problem. And the third thing is everything is expensive for them and they have no leverage. We wanted to turn that whole situation on its ear. That was the calling. And that's what made most of us walk away from you know, very large other opportunities elsewhere to create this as part of, you know, our calling. And we are doing this not for a quick buck, not for a quick exit. Um, we've funded all of this on our own, but we're doing this to really create a, a game changer in the market. Yeah, you're certainly solving a big problem because a lot of people who buy something <clears throat> from China or uh, from yep. anywhere, India, uh, it's money up yep. front. And, um, money up front. And you don't know what you're going to get. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, 
and instantly there's a problem with verification and trust. Huge. So the thing I'm curious about is how, obviously it's cost you a fair chunk of change and investment, is how did, how did, you, how did you get these businesses into your system? So we started with, uh, so we have two sets of data, and this is really important uh, because, you know, we're not a big brother company. We have two sets of data. Data set number one is all the public information about these businesses. And right now, if you look at all the big players of data, if you look at Dun & Bradstreet, if you look at all the credit bureaus, if you look at all those players, we have twice as much data as any of those players have. And we've collected that from publicly sourced data. Very expensive, but we've gone to the expense. We put that in what's called your public vault. That means if there's information about you publicly, we've collected it. And we're going right. to keep doing that and keep adding to that. Yep. That's your public vault. You don't need to do anything for that. You, you don't need to, or, or we just put it together for you to make your life easier. The second vault is the one that gets very interesting. This is the non-public vault. This is where a business comes in claims their record, which means claims their public data, gets to update it if they need to. It has to be verifiable what they update, you know, so you can't just write, you know, I, I build rocket ships when really you're building widgets. So it has to be verifiable what you update. The second set of data is all those things that represent the 17 days of friction that we talked about a little earlier, i.e. your non-public data. And that's entirely at your discretion in terms of how that's managed. You can either keep it completely private, you can choose to add it to your public profile, or you can share it selectively, either as a token or secure data. What, what does that mean? So your there are about 10 items that people are consistently asked for, their tax returns, their EIN or their company number, mm -hmm. um, a number of other things. You get to put it once in, the, in your Marquez vault that's yours, only at your control, only at your discretion, and the next time you're asked for it, instead of having to go scrounge up that stuff again or round it up, you click a button and we will send it on your behalf. So the call to action is come claim your data, not come sign up or come tell us who you are. We know who you are. We know who everyone is. Come claim your record, come update it if you need to, uh, and off you go. And uh, that process should take you somewhere between two and five minutes. Uh, it's two items of data that are required. Um, I can invite you, Jeff, to come claim your data because I want to do business with you. Or a big, a big enterprise can invite you to do that. It could be your bank, it could be your insurance company, it could be your phone company or somebody else. So we have two sides of the business. We have one side that's called Marquez for Small Business, which is the direct model where we will reach out and say, hey, come claim your data. And the other is called uh, Marquez as a Service, which is our enterprise grade solution where somebody claims the record on your behalf and says, hey, Jeff, I've, I've claimed your business for you. Here's your login details. Go update them and, you know, enjoy this platform. So you've identified a lot of problems. I'm sure you, you would have seen those in your journey with MasterCard. We have. We absolutely have. So in your journey at MasterCard, um, where you started this initial, well, um, you would have seen a lot of credit issues, I'm sure, with, and uh, yeah. was this where you started to go, wow, this is a big problem? Is that, was that yeah. part of it? Well, it was part of it, but the interesting thing that's happened in the last couple of years, particularly with COVID, is that credit scores have broken, basically. It's not good enough. Right. It's not a good enough predictor. Um, but lots of people's credit got hurt, some voluntarily, some involuntarily. So we set about to create a different set of insights for people so that they weren't hampered by just their credit score. You know, so we look at things like propensity to pay. We look at things like um, um, failure predictors. You know, what business is likely to fail in the next six months? We verify, as I said earlier, are these businesses still in business? So before you part with your money to pay for something up front, you know, is this business that you're doing business with likely to be in business by the time you get your goods or services? So you can verify that. And that goes way beyond credit scores. So that's in the verification okay. step. And like I said, we do three things, verify, monitor, and pay. Um, the monitoring bit gets kind of interesting because now we're both on the platform. We've both claimed our records. Now you can ask me to monitor a bunch of stuff that might be 
non-public data. You might say, Henny, I want to monitor your cash flow, or I want to monitor your usage of utilities, or I want to monitor, you know, that you have insurance in place. And if I and I can say yes or no to you, Marquez doesn't get in the middle of that. But whatever we agree, Marquez will facilitate that monitoring exchange, which, by the way, doesn't happen anywhere on the planet today. That's completely new. And that's very exciting because it's completely permission based. It's completely secure and it's completely bilateral between two parties doing business together. And then last but not least on payments, we're going to up in the whole world of payments and we know what we're doing because we've done it for most of our lifetime, we're going to reduce the cost of payments to as close to zero as we can get it. And we're going to give people radically new tools that help them uh, manage their cash flow in ways they never imagined possible. Yeah. Well, that uh, make <clears throat> reducing the cost of transactions a biggie, especially globally. Um, really big one. Um, and there's two things I've learned along the way here. Uh, we use a lot of use PayPal because it's a global platform. Mm -hmm. um, it's expensive. And it's three percent typically, yeah, um, yeah. and that's that's you make a hundred thousand payment, and you're handing over three thousand dollars to PayPal, and that yeah, sort of yeah. you know, tell you what that sort of pisses me off, frankly. Yeah, um, yeah. And the other thing is the banks. Well, they've got another game going on. Yes, they've got to be verifying that the payment's going to occur. So, and they've got a lot of systems and compliance. We know that. But on the other hand, there's a lot of opaqueness around exchange rates. Yeah. Yeah, and you look at it and you do is say, okay, what's the US? We, yeah. we typically get paid in US dollars because we're a yeah. you know, global business. And uh, you go and check, you know, what's the US dollar to Australian, yeah. for example, exchange rate. And it's like, okay, yeah. cool. I'm going to get X. And then you find out you've got X less five to 7% sometimes, it looks like. Yeah. You're going, yeah. I feel like I've been dudded by the bank yeah. on this exchange yeah. rate. Yeah. And there is no transparency on that by the bank there is so, no revelation of that yeah. so so we're going to change that we're going to change that dramatically so we're going to our our roadmap yeah. says we're going to give you something called a staged account which is an umbrella account that lives above all your accounts that allows you to do something really special first of all it allows you to so one of the fallacies that people assume with small businesses they have all their money tidily in one bank account and they make payments <laughs> from that account it never happens like that you know they pay with their air miles you know, Qantas or whoever your airline of choice is, they pay with their points from whatever, they borrow money from people, they use personal credit cards, they do all sorts of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. They're running a small business. That's what they do. But they don't have anywhere where they can pool all that together in one place to pay for stuff. First thing we're going to do is allow them to do that. And we're going to allow them to do that while decoupling that, you know, staging layer from the payment preference of the person that wants to be paid. So you want to be paid, Jeff, using um, um, using Bitcoin. Someone else wants to be paid using air miles. Someone else wants to be paid with a wire transfer. Someone else wants to be paid with a credit card. We will decouple those and handle that translation while all the while reducing the cost to as near to zero as we can get it. And the way we're going to do that is very simply this. Apart from allowing you to pull all your funds together, um, we're going to allow you to enter into escrow relationships. What do I mean by that? So I've got a $1,000 bill to pay Jeff. I can put that money aside. You know, it could be cobbled together from air miles and personal loans and God knows what. You don't need to see how I put it together, but you need to know that you're going to get paid. You're going to get a payment guarantee from Marquez for those funds. And once we agree that the goods have been delivered or the service rendered, we both click yes and you get paid. That's going to reduce the cost dramatically because to get that from a financial institution or from another institution is actually quite expensive. Mm. We're working with some big partners to do that. The next step is we'll actually run a net settlement system. So um, Hanny owes Jeff $1,000, Jeff owes Mary 500, Mary owes Sue 200 and so it goes instead of moving all those individual transactions around with your three percent costs or whatever we'll just settle the net between all of us so the net positions again huge saving uh and by the way while we're at it we'll write those transactions to your accounting system in real time so you don't even have to worry about doing that and then last but not least and this is the kicker we're going to run an auction model to allow you to finance or factor individual transactions. And what does that mean for listeners listening in? I have a thousand dollar bill for you, Jeff, 
and I want someone else to finance it. I don't have the money, uh, but I've been on this platform for a while and I know I'm good for it. I'll put out a request that says, who wants to finance this one transaction? Not my company, just this one transaction. And people will bid on that and I can pick whichever whichever lender I want for that one transaction. And then you and I, for that same transaction, might be on 90-day payment terms, but you want to be paid early. Now, you know in Australia, you know, if, you, if you're a small business and you do business with a big retailer, like one of the big ones there, like Coles or whatever, they'll typically say, sure, we'll pay you early, but we want a 20% discount on the bill. You'll be able to put that transaction out to bid and say, who wants to factor this? I want to be paid tomorrow instead of in 90 days. And because we have so much rich data on the platform, people will bid to factor that transaction for you again, saving you a fortune on that. It's, um, so this is looks like, sounds to me like a, you've got a product or services roadmap that obviously that you're heading towards. Um, the other thing I want to discuss, and we'll put that as the next question um, is before I forget, but is um, essentially you're becoming, you're a very modern company uh, in, yes, the sense that, in the sense that uh, you are turning data into products. Yep, we are. Yeah. And that's the real yep. big game, isn't it? So, yep. but before we do that, what are the products and services that you are currently providing today in 2021? So 2021, we have our directory with our pre-verified businesses on it. Mm -hmm. So you can come in, claim your record. You can follow companies. We call it following. Um, it can be any company in the directory. You can follow them, watch their status, watch any changes in it. Um, later this year, um, the dash, you'll, be able, you'll get your own dashboard, so your own personal dashboard that will monitor three of the most important things that every business cares about, which is cash flow, customers, and suppliers. That's the three biggest things that businesses think about, and doubly so for small businesses. And we'll show you those. We have some big-name partners who uh, will power those elements on the platform. Um, so that's that's what we'll call the hard-coded data. Um, the next bit will be what we'll call contextual data. So um, Jeff is looking for a new supplier. So we'll give you data that's relevant to you looking for a new supplier. That's contextual data. And then last but not least is customizable data. So Jeff's business cares about uh, linking to his bank and linking to his accounting software and linking to his CRM system that he uses to manage his customers. You'll be able to put all that in there. And you'll be able to see that. That's you know the three components. So hard-coded, contextual, and custom. And then we'll provide you with a bunch of insights in terms of um, what's most relevant uh, to what you're trying to do. So you, you have a reference library of things, whether they be self-assessments of how well you're doing compared to your peers or insights. So, okay, Hanny, you've told me that cyber is a big issue for my business and for most small businesses. What can I do about it? Where do I go? You'll find a reference library there that will allow you to pick that up and learn about that. And if, it, if it's important to you, we'll have some tools there that will help you do better with that. And then last but not least is, and you mentioned earlier, Jeff scores. Um, we're getting away from the notion of the blunt instrument of credit scores and we're doing mm -hmm. contextual scores. We're building those. So I'm applying for a new insurance company. How attractive do I look to this insurer? Or I'm applying for a new bank loan. How attractive do I look for that? And we'll give you contextual scores. And the difference with what everybody else does, which is basically a black box formula, we're going to expose them to you. We're going to tell you what makes up the score. And we're going to say, Jeff, this is good. This is bad. Here's how to fix it. So it's kind of an open book exercise. Yeah. So, um, so you're solving quite a few problems, and the big ones, as you mentioned, and um, but um, you've, you know, you started this business. You started it two years ago now, I believe, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Who who have been the mentors and resources that you've called on that yeah. have helped you on this journey? Yeah. yeah. And, so, what, and what have I've you learned from them? Yeah. So apart from my own scars and souvenirs from, mm. so one thing I want to tell you is everything we're doing at Marquez today, and that's on our roadmap in our constellation of advisors and team we've done before. So there's no WYSIWYGs here. There's no, if you build it, they will come. There's no field of dreams. This is all stuff we've done, but it's being brought together this way for the first time ever um, in, in this unique constellation um, in no particular order. Um, the team, including my uh, co-founder, uh, worked with me on our previous incarnation of track. 
Um, if you look on our website, you'll see people like Bobby Mader, who is the current global chairman of Jones Lang LaSalle, was previously the chairman and CEO of TransUnion, a credit bureau, previously chairman and CEO of HSBC in North America. You'll see Manny Conti. Manny was the international CEO of Dun & Bradstreet. You'll see Rob Bishop, who was the previous CEO of Optal, previous um, chief operating officer and head of the retail bank at Westpac, um, and a number of others as well. You'll, you'll see a number of other names there, including Sandy Watkins, who created Open Lending, ex-Goldman Sachs. So they were all people uh, who worked with us um, uh, and Bob Solomon, I should mention. Bob Solomon created a Pay for SAP Group. Most of those folks worked with us on track. Um, so they have the same scars and souvenirs. When we said we're doing this thing independently, they all said, let's go. We're coming with you. We're going to do it again, bigger and better and faster. So um, great people that we've known for a long time. We've been in the trenches with them who are back at it with us again. So they're in the immediate circle. Um, Fabi, my co-founder, um, you know, uh, was with me at AXA when we built a lot of the marketplaces. As soon as I said, we're spinning out and we're going, she said, let's go, I'm coming with you. We're gonna do this thing together and I'll be your co-founder and I'll invest with you to do this, which was mm -hmm. terrific. Mm -hmm. And then we've slowly put together a team of great people with highly specialized skills who are able to bring mm -hmm. these things to market, leveraging both the experience we've got in our advisory, as well as their own backgrounds in terms of their deep domain knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in looking at what you're doing and on reflection, because um, uh, I was talking to Robert Alvarez yesterday. He was from, he's from Austin, Texas, just like you. He's mm -hmm. the CFO mm -hmm. um, of Big Commerce, which is an Australian um, mm -hmm. founders, mm -hmm. uh, now worth yep. billions. Um, yep. He said, no, I asked him, so what's the success to a startup? What are the, some of the core elements? And mm -hmm. two he mentioned, which I think you're, you're certainly ticking these two. Um, number one, is the market big enough? Well, yep. it, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Very. Uh, is the technology disruptive enough? And that sounds like mm -hmm. it is. And that's yep. what you're working on right now. And I yep. think in listening to you, I'm going, wow, you guys are solving a big problem for a big market and using disruptive technology. Yep. So what's the vision for you going forward to with... Um, data products and i'm sure that the mm. data you're collecting and of course your um privacy is something that you're very mindful of i'm sure um, from the get-go so uh what's the um some of the vision for the data products and i'm sure mm. you're going to roll that over the next mm. 10 years mm. Mm. well so i'll tell you a couple of things um, we expect to be a public company in the next two years okay right. um and the reason we're doing that actually is not because we're you know, greedy pigs, but because this belongs to the public, uh, mm. what Mark has is, and that's why we're doing it. And we're actually being supported in that by um, a couple of very serious people, those who do the, the biggest and the best IPOs, um, who've encouraged us to think about this. Um, but um, a couple of really important things. First of all, we're huge believers from the get-go in um, data privacy beyond the standards, number one. Mm. Secondly, we're big believers in, um, you know, a term that you've heard many times, and that is data self-sovereignty. That means your data is yours, mm -hmm. belongs to you. Um, if we use it, we're going to ask your permission. And if it's a, it becomes valuable, we're going to let you share in the value of that data. That's really important. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very big on inclusion, not just financial inclusion, but inclusion of businesses. We are, we are the place where the smallest mom and pop in the middle of nowhere can play on the same platform as the biggest companies in the world. That's really hard to do, but we've done it. Um, so we're huge on inclusion. Um, and, and, and the fuel to that inclusion is data. Mm. That's what drives inclusion. Yeah. Knowledge, knowledge of what's out there and access. Mm. So knowledge to what's out there and access to it in a very affordable uh, very cost-effective manner. You know, if I told you what we're able to do this for, you'd laugh at me and probably fall out of your chair. Uh, but we've managed to do this in a way that costs next to nothing, mm -hmm. literally next to nothing mm -hmm. for businesses. Mm -hmm. So you've started the, this enterprise startup, um, essentially a technology company mm -hmm. um, that's solving big problems, has got a huge market and is using and developing disruptive technology. 
-hmm. What are some of the challenges you've discovered along the way that you didn't yeah. expect? Um, okay, so and I'm sure you got a, you talked Gosh. about scars and uh, so tell us a little bit about what you've learned along the way and the ch what, what are the challenges, biggest challenges you've had? Gosh, so many. <laughs> um, first of all, you know, I always quote this line, uh, you know, in every interview I give, but I, it's a line that I just love, you know, in the Men in Black one, when Will Smith asked Tommy Lee Jones, is it worth it to join the Men in Black? And Tommy Lee Jones walking away turns around and says to him, oh, yeah, it's worth it if you're strong enough. Right. And I really believe that. So mm -hmm. this is, going, you know, doing this is going to test uh, all the metal, all the resilience, everything inside you uh, in ways you can't imagine. Number one. Um, number two, whatever you think it's going to cost you to do this, double it and then double it again. Mm -hmm. um, be prepared for that out of the get go. Number three, um, there's a lot of people who are going to say, yeah, you know, let me do this with you when you're doing something like this. You don't want employees. You want people to behave as owners. I described it the other day to one of our people and said, it's like this. You're a big ATM cash machine. Those who don't know what an ATM is, mm -hmm. spitting out money. And there's only two things you can do. Slow down the rate that it spits out money or top it up. Mm -hmm. And you've got, to, you've got to think about that as the money inside is your money. If you can't think like that, this is not for you. If you don't believe the equity story, if you don't believe the strategy, do not do this. Don't join a company like this. And we've made mistakes. We've had some of the wrong people. We've had people who've seen us as an ATM that just want a free ride or want to find a way to shake us down. It's horrible. Um, it's hard. So my advice is go with people you know. Hmm. Go with people you know who you've seen doing these things well in the past, who you trust and who you know how they're going to operate in an environment like that. It's not the same as the corporate world. In the corporate world, you think, and I know I was there, you think in weeks and months and timelines. In this world, you think in minutes and hours. Mm. It's very different. There are no weekends and weekdays. You know this. You, mm. you live like this. There are no weekdays and weekends. It's one life. It's 24-7. You get to live it as one integrated life. It's fabulous if you're mm. strong enough for it. But there's no such thing as work-life balance. There's no such thing as weekdays and weekends. There's no such thing as work and family. There's none of that. It's all one. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, something that um, the mantra I have for the, you know, for my jeffbullis.com is how to win at business and life because it's one and the yeah. same. It's one and the same. Exactly, yep. Jeff. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, the other thing I've certainly heard mentioned by other founders of startups and um, entrepreneurs is that be very careful who you choose to have on your team. And you've mentioned mm -hmm. this in that you want people who are there willing to play the long game. This is mm -hmm. a long game. Mm -hmm. And also you want to make sure that the culture fit is good in that you, you know, I've heard horror stories from other entrepreneurs have, have been worth maybe billions on paper and then they've invited in investors um, and walked away with nothing because it was essentially uh, they were ripped off and uh, yeah. poisonous culture. Yeah. So, and what you've just described is the importance of, of creating the right culture from investors as well as, I'm sure, your employees. Very much. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and I, we spoke to a lot of investors that just didn't, didn't get it and they were applying a, a rule book or a slide rule from 20 years ago or a model they used that just wasn't our company. And we were like, you're not a fit for us. We, um, so we funded, we funded, we went through the hardship of putting our own money in, um, going through this. And like I said to you, you know, 99% of this company is owned by founders, by staff and by strategic, you know, partners, not, you know, not institutional players because we just didn't find the right fit. We hmm. found one guy from a fabulous uh, VC, you'll find him on our website. He was with us on the journey for three years, gave us feedback along the way, and we just liked him so much. And he said, yeah, I, I, I'm in. And he sort of set the valuation for the business. And, uh, you know, he'll have the front row seat, you know, in the next funding round and the one after, for sure. Yeah. It was the other interesting thing I came across mm -hmm. was uh, when I asked um, some of the other day I said uh, what's your exit strategy is it uh, mm. is it an IPO is it uh, you know just fundraising keep it private um, so 
or be bought out by another company. In other words, not mm. as a private company. Mm. And he said, well, I don't see an IPO. And he's um, done quite a few of these. He just, I don't see an IPO as an exit. I just see it as a couple of things. Number one, it's just fundraising. Mm. Number two, mm. it also adds credibility because suddenly you are in the public eye, you're a public company and you've got to be accountable. And with that comes, you need to be accountable. And also it, what it does create, according you know, and I've spot on, is it creates credibility. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We agree. We're in the same boat. Um, yeah. We see it the same way. We were encouraged to think about this because we were told left and right, um, this is, um, this belongs to the public. Um, this is a public good. Um, you know, we, we actually created a foundation for Marquez, you know, pretty quickly after we incorporated the business. So we created the Marquez Foundation uh, and its charter is, uh, you know, its first order of business is the Center for Inclusive Business. So we are very big believers in um, Marquez belonging to the world and anyone who wants to be an investor in it should be able to invest in it. Mm. Um, we have a couple of big name strategic partners, which I want to come back to, by the way, in terms of why would they, why would they bet in and why would they believe in, you know, a little company like this when they're multi, multi, multi billion dollar companies in their own right. And that's an interesting story in and of itself, which we should chat about. But um, we believe Marquez belongs to the world and, and we put in place so many things that are commensurate and consistent with public companies from the get-go. Um, and, you know, we sort of, someone said to us, you built this company back to front. And we're like, well, yeah, we, we sort of did. It wasn't deliberate, but we found ourselves building it back to front because we had to think about things like privacy. We had to think about things like security. We had to think about data. We had to think about um, compliance. We had to think about, you know, employee manuals. We had to think about lots of things. Um, very early in the piece to do what we're doing. And so we've got a lot of the pieces of what a public company needs. Um, and people said, well, you really should go that last step of scaling this thing up and then offering it to the public. So I agree with you completely. It, it's absolutely right. It's a mm. validation. We're not looking for a quick buck or a quick exit. We're looking to make this a, mm. you know, available to the world because that's yeah. where it belongs. Yeah. Well, you, you, you're in two years, I'm sure you're having, you had some challenges and you're learning and you're learning all along yeah. the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I'm cognizant of your time. And uh, so what are a couple of lessons that you'd like to share with our listeners and viewers that you've learned yeah. along the way, uh, both from life yeah. and also from, uh, you know, starting Marquez? What, what's some of the top yeah. learnings that you'd like to share and leave with our audience? Yeah. So a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, a lot of big businesses say they do business big business with other big businesses because it's just easier. It's just as hard to do business with a small business as it is with a big. Doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, we've got incredible global household names that are partnered with us exclusively, top of house, uh, because we actually solved something that they haven't solved, and they've told us that. Um, we've got some big banks who've said, you're doing something that we never imagined possible. We've got some big tier one partners who've said, we're rolling, you know, our lot in life with you. So don't be afraid to go approach those big players if you've really got a solution that you can credibly talk about and you can credibly demonstrate, you know, as you said earlier, Jeff, big market opportunity, big problems and solutions for them. Don't be afraid of approaching those big players. Um, you don't need to sell your soul or your company to have them join you on this quest. That's a really important one. The second thing we've talked about a little bit, and that is find people you trust and people who believe with you, um, who are willing to come on the journey because you're going to need every single one of them. Mm. Second thing. The third okay. thing is, uh, and for me, I talk a lot about this, and that is the fear gene. Um, you know, so much of our uh, life and so many people that start businesses like this have such a large dose of fear and it governs everything they do day in, day out. And you've got to find a way to get past the fear gene. It's in all of us. You just got to find a way to get past it when you do this. And, and it doesn't mean be reckless. It doesn't mean do something stupid, but you've got to find a way to get to the place where there is no plan B, mm. where what you're doing is the only thing that matters. And there is no plan B. If you have a plan B, 
you don't have your proposition right, you don't have your company right, you're not where you need to be. Thank you for sharing those. I think it's very wise. And um, I, what I love about what you're doing is you're solving a big problem and you're helping small business grow. Um, yeah. And uh, I look forward to seeing uh, Mark has evolve over the next couple of years and um, look forward to catching up in Austin one day with you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Or back in Sydney. Yeah. Or, Either way. Yeah. Thanks, Hanny. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on board. Um, and, really a uh, pleasure. Jack. Have a fireside chat. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing the company evolve and grow. So um, how can people contact you, Hanny? What's the best way to contact the company or yourself? Find us at markaz.com, M-A-R-K-A-A-Z.com. Perfect. Yeah. And by the way, what does Marquez stand for? I, you told me in the pre-show. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it, it's uh, in ancient languages. It means the center of commerce. That's where where business gets done. Okay, it's as simple as that. We added an extra A just because we wanted to. We had to find something that we could trademark. But it Marquez or Marquez is the center of commerce in That's, so many languages. I love it. Thank you very much, Hanny. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. Really a pleasure talking to you.